Hello and welcome to the WOW class. I'm Jennifer Degler. I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We are so grateful to anyone who's ever served in the military. Um, so, hey, if you have served in the military, say that in the comments section. Or if you have a family member who is serving in the military or who has served in the military in the past. I know my nephew, Mac Bartle, is currently uh, in Iraq, um, stationed there. And so we are so proud of him and his service. Uh, we're proud. Of, let's see, my friend Sherry Stewart Trendler, her son, she has a Jake, just like I have a Jake, and her son is a Marine. So lots of people um, serving. So we're so grateful. Good morning, Carlin. Good morning, Randy Lynn. Good morning, ML and Ashley. Ashley, I hope your basement is dry now. I know you had some flooding this week with all the rain that we had. Good morning, Linda and Lee. Uh, good morning, Ariana. We're glad that you're watching. Our passage today is Romans 13, and this is such a great timing. I did not plan to teach Romans 13 on the weekend of Memorial Day. It just worked out that way, but what a great time for us to study about how to be a responsible citizen and a good neighbor. This is such great timing with everything that's going on in our country. So good morning, Vanessa. Good morning, Kathy. Hey, Lisa. Hello, Carla. Hope all of you are doing well and staying healthy during this time. Good morning, Emily. Um, you know, part of God's expectations for us as believers is that we will be people who can be counted on, that we will be good citizens. We will be good neighbors. And Paul, when he was writing to the Romans in chapter 13, he gets really specific about why we are to be responsible citizens and good neighbors and what that looks like. In biblical times, when Paul was writing, the Romans were ruling over the Jews, which the Jews did not like that. They wanted to you know, to have their own uh, leadership, but instead the, the Romans had taken over. So this was an unwanted government over them. And they were very rebellious during that time. Um, in Palestine, particularly in Galilee, there was a lot of insurrection that was constantly seething. And there was a group called the Zealots that were insurrectionists in Paul's day. You may remember that one of the 12 disciples was Simon the Zealot. So one of the 12 disciples was basically had, had been part of a terrorist group. Isn't that fascinating? No one is beyond the reach of Jesus. But the zealots in those days, they were convinced that the Jews had no king except for God and that no tribute, no taxes, no tolls should be paid to anyone except for, except for God. And they believed that God wouldn't help them unless they became violent. And they, when you became a zealot, you took this sworn pledge to a career of murder and assassination. So this was a terrorist group, and they would have made any form of civil government very difficult or, or impossible. So it was really challenging for Christians, early Christians, particularly Jewish Christians, in those days to submit to the government. It can still be challenging for us to, to submit to the government. And right now, we're in a time in our country where, whether it's our city government, our state government, our national government, or in, depending on where you're at, I know we had, last week we had someone watching from Belgium, which was really fun that you joined our class all the way over there in Europe, that your government as well. There are new regulations, new policies in place because of COVID, and that can be difficult for us to submit to. So here's our first discussion question. And today we're talking about some things that are controversial. So I'm really interested in what you have to say this morning and for us to have a good discussion. Here's our first discussion question. If Christians disagree with a government's policies or commands, what are God-honoring ways that they can respond to or perhaps even resist ungodly government practices? And what kinds of responses dishonor God? So where's the line? As a believer, if you think a government regulation, policy law is ungodly, then what is a way that you can honor God and resist 
or, or respond to that policy? And where's the line where your response then becomes ungodly? So what I'd like you to do is just in the discussion and the comments area, you type out your responses and then I'm going to teach for a while and then I'll come back and read those and then we can have class discussion. So good morning, Betty. Good morning, Cindy. Hey, Beth. Hey, Julia. Good morning, Sharon and Molly. Uh, Benita. Oh, I'm so excited to see all of you ladies. Enza. Oh, she's watching from Salem, Massachusetts. Good morning, Michelle. How are you? Um, and Cheryl and Lynn, we're so glad that you're watching. Okay, so if you like to have an outline to a lesson, I like that. This lesson is three, two, one. We're going to talk about, from Romans 13, three reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities. Then we're going to talk about two obligations that believers have to governing authorities. And then one debt that believers owe to their neighbors. Three, two, one, as Paul lays them out for us. So let's talk first about the three reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities. And the first reason that Paul gives us is that God, God himself establishes governments. God establishes governments. So let's read Romans 13 verses 1 and 2. Let me read that for you. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. The New Living Translation puts part of that this way. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. That's a very clear, isn't it? Sometimes scripture is open, open to interpretation. We're not quite sure what that means. It's very clear teaching here. God is a God of order, and he establishes governments to provide order to cities and to nations. And in verse 1, that's just a real cut and dried command. Submit to governing authorities. Now let me ask you something. Let's just be honest this morning. What happens inside of you when you are commanded to submit to something or someone who is in authority over you? I don't know about you, but often there is this part of me that just rises up and says, you are not the boss of me. Okay, you just hit that blue thumbs up like button if there is a part in you that also tends to just, oh, that part of you that wants to say, you are not the boss of me. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the blue thumbs up. Were you all good? I'm glad I was hoping I wasn't the only person. And, you know, perhaps we're that way because human authority has been abused and misused. Abuse, incompetence, it tempts us to rebel, to disrespect. It's hard to trust when you've seen a human authority misused and abused. So there is that. There is that explanation. But also that part of us can just rise up and say, you're not the boss of me because we're proud. We want to rule ourselves. We want to be in complete control of our lives, and we think we know what's best. It feels humiliating. It can feel like we're out of control to submit to authority when we think we know better than the people who are in power. Let me tell you a little story about this. So years and years ago, I was a discussion leader in a Bible study. And so I had a group of about 15 women that I would lead discussion with. And one of my responsibilities was to make them a name tag. And you had to laminate it and it had a little pin on it. And then that way, every week they could wear that name tag. And it was really helpful. That way I would know what their name is. We would know what each other's names are. And as well, the, the church itself that was hosting the Bible study it had a school there, and so it wanted to know if there are people in the building, they have a reason to be in the building. And so it was also a security thing to let the different 
that to let the church know this this person is in this um, church um, for a reason. So I had a lady in my group who every week didn't wear a name tag. So I always had stick on name tags and I would I would be leading the group and I'd notice she wouldn't have her, her name tag on. And I'd say, oh, do you need a stick on name tag? She'd say, yeah, yeah, I need one. So I'd pass her a stick on name tag. So this kept going on week after week after week. And finally I thought, I bet she's lost her name tag. That's why she's not wearing her name tag. And she's embarrassed to, to tell me because then I'll have to make her a new one and you have to laminate it, which is kind of a pain. So after, after our group, I caught her and I said, hey, if you've lost your name tag, you just let me know and I'll make you a new one. And she said, oh, I'm not, I, I haven't lost my name tag. My name tag's just right there in my car. I just don't like wearing that name tag. I guess you could say it's my little way of rebelling. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I think that is the funniest story. And I appreciated that at least she was honest about it. And so she's my name tag rebel. And I think about that. I think about her when I get my back up about things where I just want to rebel. I don't want to submit. But you see, verses 1 and 2 in Romans 13, they make it very clear. When we, without a biblical basis, when we refuse to obey the law, we are rebelling not just against the law. We are rebelling against God. So we want to say, well, I'm just rebelling against this policy, this guideline, this law that I don't like. I'm, I'm rebelling against the mayor that I don't like or the governor or the president or the prime minister I don't like. But scripture says you're actually re rebelling against God himself because he established, he put that person with their policies in place. And then in verse 2, it explains that our rebellion will bring judgment on ourselves, probably through those authorities. Okay, now I want you, wherever you are at, to pick up your feet. Go ahead, pick up your feet, because I'm about to step on your toes. I want you to apply this. Where are you a name tag rebel? Where, maybe you're not a name tag rebel. Maybe you're a face mask rebel. Maybe you're a social distancing rebel. Because you've decided you know better than anyone else in authority. And that the government has no right to tell you what to do. Does it make a difference when you consider that God looks at your words, that God looks at your choices as rebelling directly against him? And will you humbly consider whether there might be a prideful, nobody's the boss of me, attitude behind your words and your actions? It is so important during this time that we as believers do not confuse pride with faith. So you all have been posting your answers to our first discussion question. I'm eager to go back and look at those and see what you've had to say in response to if Christians disagree with a government's commands or policies, what are God honoring ways that they can respond to and perhaps even resist to ungodly policies? And then what kind of responses dishonor God? So where's the line? So I'm eager to hear what you have to say about that. So let me just kind of go back and see what all of you all have posted. All right, I'm trying to use my little, okay, trying to use this little mouse that Jeff gave me. So here we go. Hey, Pat. Hey, Allison. Hey, Carol. So Peggy says a God-honoring way to respond is to pray for our leadership, to get involved and demonstrate God's love in our actions. Yes. And, and I think, Peggy, to stop and ask ourselves to reflect on, is, is God's love? reflected in my actions or is something else reflected in my actions? Good morning, Danielle. Linda says, we do have to educate ourselves on elected officials, stands and beliefs. I'm having trouble seeing the rest of that. And pray for the governing authorities that they, okay, this is, 
All right. Sorry, I can't. I don't know why this isn't working where I can see the rest of that. Um, let's see. Emily says, I think of the church's response when the government requested they close their doors. Churches that refused to close even when the government requested that they do so reflected negatively on the way Christians seem to view government mandates. That's such a great point, Emily. Sometimes it can we can just feel like uh, that, again, we can confuse pride with faith and thinking that <clears throat> what 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 impact does this have on the world that is watching and a world that is impacted in this case their very health can be impacted by our actions good point emily so julie says what if the government is not following our beliefs like the spending of our state government. We're going to talk about that, Julie. That's such a great question. What do we do when we don't um, always like that? Um, let's see. Lisa says, I feel like we need to comply unless it is ungodly, but we need to be careful what we support as godly. For example, not, okay, she's talking about gay marriage. It's a personal choice, but when you work for a government entity, um, yeah, and this is a little long, Lisa, so I'm just going to kind of scan through this. She's saying, always remember God is in control and that it's um, the government we don't agree with. He establishes all government. So ask God, what is the lesson you're trying to teach us in this matter? Lisa, that's such a great point to keep going back to the Lord. Because I don't know about you guys, but when when I feel passionately about something and, and I'm beginning to talk with other people about this, maybe we have different opinions, I can begin to kind of fall in love with my own opinion, even fall in love with the sound of my own voice and get on my little high horse. And at some point I lose sight of th these other people that maybe have a different opinion than me. They are people that God wants me to love and to reach for him and reaching them for Christ and bringing them into helping introduce them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is far more important than any of these other issues. The issues are important, but what would God say is ultimately eternally important? And that is the salvation of people's souls, that all of these issues will pass away, but truly it is the soul that is eternal. So um, Kathy says she's watching with Ashley. We're glad you're there, Ashley. Good morning, Angela. Um, let's see, Sharon says, it's the duty of Christians to pray for our leaders, to vote in office, those who follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, to be supportive of our leaders to reach out to those in authority over us with phone calls and letters and obey the law. Great point, Sharon. We, we can communicate so many times if we're upset with something that's going on in our government. We just talk to other people around us about it, but we don't actually reach out to the people that are in leadership. And it's easy now. They, I mean, you can email, they have lines set up that you can call and phone in and leave your opinion. So that's a great point to whatever mess, uh, methods that there already are there to reach out to them, to reach out to them. Okay. Good morning, uh, Palusa. I'm glad you're watching. Good morning, Sherry. Hey, and Sherry, I was telling them earlier that your son is in the Marines. We are so grateful for your Jake's service. Um, so good morning, sissy. Uh, Annette says, am I praying for leaders as much or more than I complain about them? Well, sissy, thanks for getting on this and stepping on my toes right off the bat. That is such a good point. Are we praying for them? Or are we just complaining about them? That is really convicting me. That's just like my sister to just hit home with the truth right away. Good morning, Jennifer, all the way out there in Kansas City. So these are God-honoring ways that we can disagree. Um, you know, we can attend peaceful demonstrations. We can attend meetings. Somebody said, I don't know if somebody said run for office, but that is a great way if you are unhappy with policies, then you run for office or support those who are running for office. But what is ungodly? And certainly if I decide I'm going to blow up an abortion clinic because I think abortion is ungodly, 
then I have crossed a line because at that point I'm becoming a terrorist. I may possibly end up murdering someone else in the process of doing that. Uh, we have an election here in the United States, a presidential election in November. And if I don't like who's elected and I decide to organize a coup and, and siege Washington, D.C. with guns and take over the White House, that is not a godly way to respond to that. We can certainly look at the civil rights demonstrations of the 1960s and see these were godly ways to respond to ungodly practices and policies that were in place in the United States. We can look at believers who hid Jews from the Nazis during World War II in Europe, and they were breaking the law, but they were obeying a higher law um, of, that was God's law. And so those are great examples of Christians who were brave enough to um, respond in godly ways to ungodly policies. I'm glad you all are turning your brains on this morning. You know, if you actually, if you're a member of the WOW class and have come to the WOW class for a while, you know, one of the things I say over and over to my class is don't turn your brain off when you walk in a church. Don't turn your brain off when you open your Bible. You turn your brain on that God gave you and think. And always before I read the Bible, I always just stop and say, Lord, speak to me through your word so that he will show me what is the truth that is there. And so whoever's teaching, preaching that you're sitting under, don't turn your brain off. Turn your brain on and really think through. Think through these hard things, these hard questions. Okay, so we've been talking about three reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities. The first one we, we said was that God establishes governments. The second reason is that even bad governments restrain evil. So even bad governments are preferable to the chaos of anarchy. Even bad governments are preferable to the chaos of anarchy. So our next discussion question, and this is another one that this is convicting me, how can we pay respect and honor to government officials that we don't think are very worthy of honor or respect? How can we pay respect and honor to government officials that we don't think are very worthy of honor or respect? And so you type your answer there in the comments section. I'm going to teach for a while and then I'll come back. And I'm eager to hear what you have to say because I need some help with this particular one. So our second reason to submit to governing authorities is this, this idea that Paul's going to teach us that even bad governments are preferable to the chaos of anarchy. And let me read for you Romans 13, 3 through 4. It says, For rulers hold no terror for those who do no wrong. Do you want to be free from the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. You see, Paul is recognizing that unwanted Roman government over the Jewish people, that they did serve a purpose that God knew they would restrain evil. Even dictators restrain evil. They will punish thieves or punish rapists or murderers. A government promotes good conduct and obeying of laws. They, a government is necessary to maintain some kind of law and order. And usually, what Paul points out is usually if you're doing what is right, you can be free from the fear of authorities. Now, our third reason why Christians should submit to governing authorities is it's the right thing to do. That's what Paul's going to teach us. Our third reason to submit is that it is the right thing to do. Let me read for you Romans 13, 5. He says, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. The New Living Translation puts it this way. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. And the message just says it this way. 
because it's the right way to live. So yes, God gives governments the right to punish people who do wrong. But for a believer, we submit to authority, not just to avoid punishment, but because living responsibly is the right thing to do. You see, that's a higher motivation. We see this bigger picture of God's purpose for government, that, that government is God's way of maintaining peace and protecting us from evil. Let me give you an illustration. You know, when I was a kid, the only reason I cleaned up my bedroom was I didn't want to get punished. It, there was no other reason. I saw no purpose in cleaning up my room. So I, got pun I would get punished if I didn't clean up my room. But now that I'm an adult, I, I clean up my room because I see the bigger picture, that it maintains order, that it maintains hygiene and sanitary conditions to live in. It's also considerate of other people because somebody else shares my bedroom now. Jeff is in there too. And let me just tell you, he is one of the neatest people you'll ever run into. I'm the messy. He's the neat in this relationship. But I see the bigger picture now. I'm not, I'm not following that guideline just to avoid punishment, but because I see the bigger picture, how it affects more than just me. So we submit to government because it's part of God's bigger picture and purpose for government. But let me just say there are limits on this command for us to obey the government. And I think somebody referenced this earlier Authorities are put in place by God, but if they place themselves above God, then believers are to disobey and perhaps even resist. It's an important note for us. The Bible doesn't teach blind obedience to human authorities. We defer to the authority unless it involves obvious sin before God. We see this in Acts 5. The um, Sanhedrin have brought Peter and the disciples before them, and they're very upset because the disciples, um, the apostles, are, are preaching the gospel. And they tell them, you, you, you need to stop teaching about Jesus. And in Acts 5, 29, Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. So they're not going to stop teaching about D Jesus, even though the authorities are saying, we command you to stop teaching about Jesus. So there's a note for us there. God's commands take precedence over human government. So if a governmental law doesn't oppose God's law, then we should obey it. If it does obey, oppose God's law, then we should obey God first and disobey the governmental law. So we've learned three reasons why believers should submit to governing authorities. And now we're going to talk about two obligations that believers have to governing authorities. Two obligations that believers have to governing authorities. And those two obligations are monetary obligations and attitude obligations. And we're getting ready uh, here in a minute or two to talk about our second discussion question. If you haven't had a chance to post a comment to answer that, the discussion question people are posting about is, how can we pay respect and honor to government officials we don't think are very worthy of honor and respect? So let me read for you Romans 13, 6 through 7. That says, This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servant who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Again, very clear teaching. Number one, that we have a monetary obligation to the government. And, and Paul mentions two kinds of monetary obligations, taxes and revenue. So revenue would be like um, a, a toll maybe or some kind of special fee that you would have to pay. You know, we enjoy benefits because of the taxes that we pay. Schools and police and fire and a military, roads, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. 
So grab a hold of this. Even if you think your taxes are too high, and even if you think the government wastes your tax money, believers are still obligated to pay all of our obligations. And just hit that blue like button right now if you think your taxes are too high or if you think the government sometimes wastes your money. And I would imagine all of us are going to hit that blue like button and say, yes, I don't always agree with how they spend my money. And I don't think I should have to pay as many taxes as I have to pay. So we're all in the same boat here. And yet scripture is very clear to us that believers <laughs> see a whole flood of blue thumbs up. Yes, we're in the same boat again here, but we are still obligated to pay <clears throat> all of our obligations. And we do have monetary obligations. Now this year we got an extra few months to pay those taxes because of COVID, but we do still have to pay them. We also though, Paul tells us um, at the end of this passage in seven, he says, it, you know, if you owe them respect and pay respect, if you owe them honor, then pay them honor. So that's number two, our attitude obligations that we have to the government for respect and honor. Respect being a genuine recognition of authority and honor being a proper display of esteem towards that office that they hold, whether they're the mayor or the governor or the president or the prime minister, whoever it might be, that we honor being that proper display of esteem towards that person's office or position. So I'm eager to hear in, uh, what your answers are to our question. How can we repay that attitude obligation to government officials if we don't think, in our personal opinion, that they're, that they're worthy of respect and honor. So I am eager to hear what you all have to say because I, I need a little, sometimes I need a little attitude help. Just because I teach Sunday school doesn't mean I don't need a little attitude help. So let me see what you all have to say. Um, good morning, Ann. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. We can pray. Julie says we can pray for them. We can keep our comments to ourselves <laughs> rather than on Facebook or Twitter and share scripture rather than sharing divisive information. Um, yeah, I tell you, we can get so divisive and ugly there. Sometimes this, I'm trying to push the little see more button. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work for me to see the rest of the comment. Uh, good morning, Becky. Uh, Rebecca, let's see. And Betty says to pray, to pray for God, uh, for them to be used by God. That is such a wonderful way, um, Betty, if we're not feeling that honor and respect. Because when we pray for somebody, then it changes our heart towards them. Andrea says, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And if you're in a group or conversation where people are I'm sorry, guys, for some reason, I can't seem to get these, the rest of these comments to come up. Um, Kathy says, God can use ungodly leaders to accomplish his plan. We're going to talk about that. Kathy, you're teaching my lesson. Yes, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, and Lisa says, we can honor them by remembering that God established the government and we're honoring the position and honoring God. Um, and that we don't have, again, I don't know what's wrong here, but it's not letting me see all of the comment. Damien says, always pray for our leaders and respect the position of authority. Also ask and pray how this struggle um, can grow our leaders. Yes, we can definitely do that. Um, let's see. And Lisa says, always remember the end of the story. We win, or I could say God wins, therefore we win. That's right. When we have someone in a position of authority, and we're just like, oh, I cannot believe that person has been elected to that office or chosen for that position to realize that's not the end of the story and that God is going to use somehow. We, we were studying about this uh, a couple of weeks ago when we studied Romans 8, 28. God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so he can work through those leaders that we maybe are really unhappy with them and don't think that they are worthy of honor and respect. Um, 
Let's see, Beth says, respecting doesn't mean agreeing. We are called to show respect to government leaders, um, and this could look like praying for them. Um, yes, and uh, let's see. Peggy says to get involved. If we're involved, it opens up the door to be impactful for the work, but it also provides access to, um, i tell you, this little thing is really making me nuts. It's not working at all here. Okay, and then Danielle says, what to do about oh oh okay I got it to work um I think respect Daniel says I think respect can be expressed by refraining from bashing criticizing and speaking ill of government officials that we don't agree with being careful of our speech can show respect it doesn't mean we don't have an opinion it means we're showing restraint thank you Danielle I tell you that restraint we're modeling if, if we don't show restraint we're just encouraging others to lose their restraint as well. And then things become very uncivilized and really ugly. Um, yeah, so being careful of our speech. Thank you. Good morning, Janet. It was fun to be with you guys yesterday with the Camping Buddies. Um, we had a, a socially distant uh, outdoor picnic with some friends of ours. So good morning, Janine. Good morning, Michelle. Okay, so I think I figured out I'm not going to use this little thing anymore. It is not working for me to be able to see the rest of your comments. So I'm just going to have to keep touching the screen. So the thing about leaders that we don't respect or honor and or feel are worthy of honor, we need to remember that in his time, God removes the really bad and truly corrupt leaders. We see this in the Bible. We see this today. Hitler, Mussolini, Saddam Hussein, Omar Gaddafi, they are no longer in power. Eventually, God will bring disaster to all evil governments. But often, in the meantime, the corrupt government is helping further God's purposes, whether that corrupt leader knows it or not. Just like the Jews were so unhappy with that Roman rule over them, but the Romans actually helped spread the gospel. How? because they had an amazing road system. That was one of the things that the Roman Empire brought to the world is an incredible network of roads. And all the persecuted Christians walked on those roads to all parts of the world in order to be, a, and they shared the gospel. So today the gospel is spreading most quickly in, do you know where? in Asia and in Africa. Um, the top 20 countries where the gospel is spreading the fastest, 11 of those countries are Muslim countries where Christians are persecuted. So you see, God can use corrupt or evil um, governments to help spread the gospel. He is at work. He is always at work. So if we put all this together, we see that as Christians, God expects us to be responsible citizens whom he can count on because it is high quality citizens, not high quality laws that make a strong nation. A government can only enforce morality. A government cannot make people moral. Only a personal relationship with Jesus Christ can make people truly moral. And so Christians must be the presence of Christ in our cities and in our nations so others will be drawn to Christ, saved and transformed. And lastly, real quickly, let's look at that one debt that believers owe to neighbors. So we've had our three reasons, we've had our two obligations, and now we have our one debt that believers owe to neighbors. And here's our last discussion question. What are creative ways to be a good neighbor during COVID-19? What are creative ways to be a good neighbor during COVID-19 with the different social distancing guidelines and all those sorts of things that are in place now that our governments have put in place? How can you still be a good neighbor? And let me read for you Romans 13, 8 through 10. It says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. 
the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the golden rule. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. We owe our government officials respect and honor. We owe our neighbors love. And that's not just loving feelings. It's loving actions. Actions that promote their well-being. And there in verse 8, it, it, Paul talks about paying a debt. And I don't know about you, but I like to pay debt off as fast as I can. And Paul is saying here, there's, you should, as a believer, really only have one debt that you can never pay off. You can never repay. And that's the debt of love owed to Jesus for what he did for us on the cross. And the only way to make payments on that debt to Jesus is to continue to love one another. Just like he taught us in John 13, 34, and 35, that we are to love one another. And according to the Good Samaritan parable that Jesus told in Luke 10, everyone is my neighbor. Everyone is your neighbor. Now, I live in a neighborhood. Maybe you live in a neighborhood too. My neighborhood is called Plantation. I live in the neighborhood of Plantation. But according to Jesus, I live in and you live in a neighborhood called Planet Earth. So in verse 9, it's telling us to love our neighbors in Planet Earth neighborhood that we need to practice the golden rule. So how can we apply this? Well, when we're in situations with people, to ask ourselves, how would I want to be treated in this situation? And that will help us to treat others with kindness, with fairness, with encouragement, with love. So when we go to the grocery store and we're frustrated because that grocery store employee will not allow us in yet, and there's a part of us that wants to say mean things because we're frustrated, we're in a hurry, we didn't want to wait outside the grocery store, but there are now limits on the number of people that can be inside that store safely. What are we going to do? Well, we are to ask ourselves, how would I want to be treated if I were that grocery store employee whose job it is to enforce that regulation? And hopefully what we will do is say kindly to them, thank you for working. That's what we'll do if we love our neighbor. And there in verse 10, it says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. So that means we refrain from wronging our neighbor. This applies even if our neighbor, the other person, is not following the golden rule towards us. You know, we can't take the golden rule and turn it into the pyrite rule. You know, pyrite, fool's gold, false gold. That The pyrite rule is do unto others as long as they're doing good stuff back to you. That's the pyrite rule. But the golden rule is do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, whether they're doing good to you or not. So loving everyone well, that's the best evangelism that there is. And what a time for us to be able to evangelize here in the neighborhood of planet Earth by doing good. So we're going to close by looking at this your answers to the discussion question. What are creative ways to be a good neighbor during COVID-19? So let me see some of the things that you've had to say here. Good morning, Vicki. Let's see. Livy says, if, um, let's see. Oh, she's talking about the previous one. If you dish it, be prepared to take it. Authoritative or not, all people are human and make mistakes. Not all mistakes can be justified, but there's a certain amount of human error that we know will occur. Complaining won't fix the errors. Only support and kind reminders or recommendations will help the most. Great advice, Livy, on how do we honor and respect Leaders that we don't always think are worthy of honor and respect. They're human. They're trying. They're going to make mistakes. Yes. Okay, let's see what else have people have said. Um, let's see. Daniel says, I prefer not to wear a mask when going into stores, but I wear a mask out of respect for those who are fearful, anxious when people don't wear them and because a lot of places require it now. Daniel, that's such a great point that we are, even if we're feeling like I'm not afraid and I don't really feel like this is necessary, to be loving and to think how 
are other people feeling in my presence if I don't have a mask on? And perhaps they're not feeling like they can even get out because people won't wear masks. And so it's a simple thing for me to do. It's an easy thing for me to do, really in the grand scheme of things. Um, they're not asking us to hop on one foot the entire time we're in the grocery store. They're just asking us to wear a mask. Um, Damien says another way to be a good neighbor is meeting tangible needs, check on each other, help with physical needs and mental health. Thank you, Damien, for pointing out the mental health part. I think it's so important now that we are checking in with one another. How are you holding up? I think that's something Beth shared in a previous WOW class that she asked the, the people that are working at Lowe's, the postal carrier, if she's talking to him, how are you holding up and checking in with people? Um, Lisa says, uh, love is the, that's the answer. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Always compare your actions and responses to love. If it isn't a love response, then you don't need to do it or you don't need to say it. And perhaps that's why there's a mask over your face at times, Lisa, because our impulse is to say or do things that are not loving. And look, now we don't need duct tape. We've, we've got a mask. Um, Betty says, what could you do? You could reach out to new neighbors, even when they're standoffish. Wave, smile, give them permission to knock on your door with any needs. Yes, Betty, this is such a great time to reach out to people. Um, you never know. Sometimes standoffish people, it's not that, that maybe they're just more of an introvert or maybe they're just somebody that uh, is waiting for you first as the established neighbor to reach out. Um, let's see. Sharon says, what an opportunity for the Christian community to get even more involved with those in authority who, who are in opposition to God's teaching. Yes, you never know how God's going to use your good work, your prayer, your involvement, your encouragement to influence and change a life for good for Jesus. Yes, love is the only way to conquer hate. That's what Sharon says. Certainly, yes, our government officials are our neighbors. They're part of planet Earth. And so loving on them as well. Anyone who has been in leadership for the last several months is tired. This is really, it's been really hard. They've had to make a lot of decisions very quickly. And so loving on them as well. Okay, and let's let me, last, last one here. Beth says, ask neighbors how they're holding up during COVID, how you can pray for them. Ask if they need anything from the store. Yes, that's great, Beth, to ask people, how can I pray for you? Very, very few times will people look at you and say, don't pray for me. Oftentimes they might even get tears in their eyes to think that you would do that for them. Yeah. So thank you for those. Well, let me pray for us before, before we end our class. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this such practical teaching in Romans 13. Lord, what your timing is perfect. And I know I needed this teaching and I hope those who, who are in class today that it's been helpful to them as well and challenging. Lord, help us to be responsible citizens. Help us, Lord, um, to, to pay our taxes, to pay honor and respect to those in authority. Help us to do that, Lord, to submit out of reverence for you and to see that rebellion is in fact rebellion against you. Help us to pray for our leaders, even those that we don't like. Help us to pray for them. And Lord, help us to love our neighbors, to do good to them, whether they're doing good to us or not. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So it's been so wonderful to be here with you today. I look forward to seeing you next week. If you are a part of the actual WOW class that meets at Emmanuel Baptist Church, I want to remind you that tomorrow we will not have our regular fun Zoom meeting because it's Memorial Day. But I'll see you the following uh, Monday night for a Zoom call when we can get together and laugh and have some fun and pray together. It's been so wonderful. I look forward to um, seeing you next week. I hope you have a great, relaxing Memorial Day. Um, maybe you can hopefully get outside, maybe be in a small group of people. I know we went kayaking yesterday, my husband and my son and I, and that was so fun. And we got together with a few, few of our friends outside and, and had, um, grilled some steaks and it was just really good to be with some people, but do make sure you're pa practicing those social distancing guidelines. So love you guys and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.